Uh, hi everyone, I'm back. Yeah, I bet you didn't even realize I was gone for, um, uh, y you know, that many weeks. But, you know, the original plan was to just use stream highlights until I recovered from the surgery I had. Uh, and that's why there's been no streams or anything. So sorry if you've been bored in the meantime. But we're back, baby, and I'm all healed up. And I even got a swell little cane to walk around with back when I was recovering, which I forgot to bring to the recording today. So I was gonna do a fun little song and dance number with the cane, but I guess I'll just have to do it without the cane. So a one, a two, a three, hit! <laughs> Andrew, what's the cast of Peter Pan doing here? Oh yeah, they're here for the Ocarina of Time review you promised. An Ocarina of Time review. Uh, okay, yeah, that's gonna be a little difficult because I never really saw the appeal. Um, okay, maybe I should like preface this with a little bit of personal background stuff. So you see, when I was born 2600 years ago, uh, the gods that may or may not be were like, hey everybody, it's big small brain hours. And thus, every time I see a puzzle, I start secreting anxiety out of my eyes. It's not crying, I swear. So it's no surprise that I gravitated more towards the Mario series when I was younger, because all the problems in that franchise can be solved with brute force, crushing the enemy beneath your mighty Tims. So in my brain when it came to Zelda, I was kind of like, oh my god, I gotta think about my actions, or I'll die or something. What is this, real life? Fast forward from my birth a little bit towards the fifth grade, Lil Dylan has pneumonia, amongst a lot of other things that I'm not gonna talk about, and he pulls up a chair to the Wii to play his first ever Zelda game, Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. And I gotta be honest, I have no idea how I did it back then, because whenever I play the game now, I kinda get stuck around the snow temple, and uh, I don't wanna play anymore. But, you know, I, I guess fifth grade Dylan with pneumonia had a little bit more uh, drive and passion. That's sad. After that point, I would only actually play three other Zelda games, and those would be Link Between Worlds on 3DS, Majora's Mask 3DS because I was into how weird and creepy it was, and of course Breath of the Wild because I had to play something on Switch when it launched and it wasn't going to be that $50 tech demo ass game 1-2 Switch. Like what the hell were you guys thinking? It's not like the 3DS's launch was any better though because like what could you play Rayman 2 except the worst port of it and also Steel Diver? Man, options. Despite my history with the franchise, it was kind of impossible to exist on this earth without at least hearing about Ocarina of Time, because, you know, wherever you go, it's like, oh, Twilight Princess was just an attempt to recapture the magic of Ocarina, and they didn't do it as well, or, oh man, this game's just a ripoff of Ocarina of Time, or, man, Ocarina of Time is the most impressive and best game ever made, but what does Metacritic know? Because they listed World of Goo on WiiWare, like 50-something places higher than Super Mario 64, the father of 3D platformers? Like what even- I don't- I literally don't even know what World of Goo is, and it's not like I can check because Nintendo keeps, you know, removing digital marketplaces, but, you know, I mean, I guess there's always... But anyway, I'm stalling at this point. Reviewing Ocarina of Time is a very intimidating endeavor for me because it is very outside of my wheelhouse. I've never played it before, and just like Mario 64, it's the father of its own respective genre. Which means, uh, if I mess this up, I'm never gonna be able to live it down. It's not like I can just, you know, not post YouTube videos anymore, because YouTube wouldn't like that. But I'm not here to reinvent the wheel. I am here to play through Ocarina of Time for the first time ever, and I'm gonna tell you how it went and what I thought of it. And I hope that is enough for you, because it's certainly enough for me. Uh, I am gonna cry, though. So let's see if uh, I could stop crying for enough time to tell you if Ocarina of Time actually lives up to the hype. Listen! The game opens up during a thunderstorm. A young lad stands near a castle while a man atop a magnificent horse tells him to talk to the hand. Before long, a fairy speeds through a bustling forest society to wake the same young man we just saw from his slumber. This, of course, is Link. Or, you know, whatever you decide to call him. I had some restraint this time around. But, uh, you know, Link is told that he's been called by the Deku Tree, the father of him and all the other Kokiri. More like the dad Ku Tree, am I right? Anyway, let's go see dear old dad. Merging into the forest for the first time and just taking in the sights sort of had me feeling some kind of way. I kind of felt like a kid stumbling into some kind of magical adventure all of a sudden. 
until my, you know, cynical adult nature returned to me as Mido started dancing on my parade. <laughs> We're given a few quick tutorials here, and I really like how this is handled, because it's not like, hey, press these buttons to do all these things. It's like, hey, go explore this area, and you'll figure some things out, and if you don't, looks like it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and you're the dog getting eaten, not the dog eating. In a short span of time, you learn about rolling, which is a really fast way to get around. You learn about crawling through tight spaces to find secrets, and you also learn how to farm rupees, which is very, very important for many things later on. Specifically, right now, because before we're allowed to go see the Deku Tree, we have to acquire a Deku Shield and the Deku Sword. Or maybe it's the Kokiri Sword. It's been like a month since I started the game, so... Give me a break. And that farming rupees thing I mentioned is important because apparently Link's allowance is not very good. Looks like the Deku tree might be a certified broke birch. That's a funny joke because he's a tree and it sounds like b After making enough money to afford the shield and finding the sword over in the weird storage closet out back, we stumble down the hall towards Dad's office where he tells us something about religion or whatever and then drops a bombshell. Oh my god, he's dying and he doesn't have a life insurance policy. And we need to save him and the world! <laughs> oh my god, I'm 10 years old! With that, the stage is set and we're already on to the first dungeon! It's Big Dad Tree, first dungeon. I am a huge fan of how fast the action starts here because I gotta say, there is nothing that makes me put down a new game faster than devs just shoving endless tutorials into your face because they don't think you can just figure out some simple mechanics like rolling around or, in Persona 5's case, literally everything they tell you about. But maybe that's not the best example because I did finish Persona 5, and you should too. It's a very good game. The stakes are very high right off the bat, because if we don't defeat the evil that's plaguing dear old Dad Tree, he will die and leave all the Kokiri as orphans just like Link. Oops, sorry, that's a spoiler. Oh man, Link's not a Kokiri, who saw that coming? Suffice to say, the urgency of this first task hooked me immediately, and it's not like I know the Deku Tree personally or anything, he feels more like a friend of a friend but I'll be damned if I'm gonna let this guy die. Inside the main chamber of the Deku Tree, one of the main things you'll be doing is climbing around all over the place. At first, that is simple, but then once you go up a level or two, you end up finding that there are some spiders in the way that really don't want you to be climbing. So it looks like we'll need some kind of ranged weapon to progress. And this paints a picture of how the entire game will work. We introduce obstacle, make you get used to it, then they spice it up and have to introduce something else to make it a little bit better, you know, like, like the cherry on top. Or in this case, it's the slingshot on top. In a way, it's kind of like a little math equation, except it's one I actually want to solve because the result is me getting stronger and being able to wipe spiders off the face of the earth, because, like, very icky. Don't like, please die. After getting baited by some small fry items like the map and the compass, we eventually come across the slingshot, and now there's no way Bart Simpson could beat Link in a fight. And I'm sure you've noticed at this point that the footage is of Ocarina of Time 3D, and I decided to play that version because I really like the gyro controls on the 3DS. It makes aiming feel very immersive. And uh, if you're gonna come up and say, hey, I should have played the N64 version because that's the genuine experience, uh, this was built off of the N64's code, like, almost exactly. Like, I don't think there's any differences at all. There are a couple of quality of life enhancements, and when I play something for the first time, I am always a big supporter of things that make it simpler for someone to jump into for the first time. So, like, I'm not going to intentionally handicap my run just because you're a purist. You know? It's, it's like... This is a very serious matter to me, and I'm sticking to my guns on that. This is a very serious review channel where I like to give these games the benefit of the doubt, and there's no funny business to be seen. Yeah, f*** you spiders, get out of my den! Climbing to the tippity tree top, we find the Papa Spider, presumably, who is a lot bigger, but dies in just about as much time. This allows us to jump back down to the main part of the chamber and destroy Spider-Man's pride and joy, but also lets us into Dad's basement. I'm never allowed down here. He said it's dangerous, full of spiders and fire and flammable things. There shouldn't really be fire in a tree, I don't think. I, uh, I think that's a poor decision, and if, I, if I'm let loose with this fire, I'm not responsible for what might happen. But this shows us that physics do indeed work in this world, as in fire plus slightly flammable object equals, oh man, look at there's a chest or a door or 
some really nice things for us to go play with. In the next couple rooms, we find some old Deku scrubs running around, and Pacifist Link decides not to slaughter them, but instead heed their warnings. This allows us into Queen Goma's main chamber, where we are going to slaughter the shit out of her because Pacifist Link has left the building. The tree, the tree, the tree building. Queen Goma's down here polluting the Deku tree with her gigantic crypto mine, but unfortunately for her, NFT actually stands for no fucking spiders. So she goes out pretty quickly. Man, I'm so glad we got rid of that spider thing. Dad is gonna be so proud of me. All right, well, I guess now we have to attend a funeral, but on the bright side, now I've got four hearts instead of three. Jumping back a few moments to before he died, dear old Deku tells us that we were adopted, that's a big shocker, but he also says that the dream we've been having is actually a premonition and we have a huge part to play in the fate of the universe. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I would be absolutely pissing if a giant tree with a Mario mustache told me I had to run through Hyrule Field on foot. That place is ginormous. Well, I mean, that's all I can do here, I guess. Uh, kill the tree and doomed the entire forest a little bit, but technically it wasn't my fault, it's Ganon's fault. And don't you forget it. On the way out, I wave goodbye to Mido. Sorry, dude, your dad's dead. And also, Saria gives me this very nice and thoughtful ocarina, which I promise I won't replace with one with magic powers in a couple hours. Oh, sick, new whip. Outside of the forest, Link has the first of many conversations with Kepora Gebora, a character who no one has ever made a joke about before here. I'll be the first. Give me one second. I just looked at my notes and... Uh... <clears throat> right, uh... Man, don't you ever shut up? Yeah, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I know, I'm making myself laugh here. I'll be here all week. All right, anyway, back to Hyrule Field. And I've heard this is where most people say the adventure truly begins because it's this wide open space and you can go anywhere you want. But I just really want to get to Hyrule Castle as fast as possible because apparently skeletons are real in this universe and that is very detrimental to my health. After a long night of struggling against the undead, Link finally enters Hyrule Castle Town. And this is another benefit of the 3DS version. Now all of these areas in the castle are actually modeled instead of being made of reused cereal box cardboard. So uh, yeah, you can keep that old shit, Captain. We have a couple points of interest here, aside from the castle itself. We have a regular shop where you can buy certain things. You've got a mask shop, which I don't care about very much because we're not playing Majora's Mask. And there's also the Temple of Time, which is not worth investigating at the moment. So, um, I mean, there's a time and place for everything, I guess. Up the road a bit, we meet Malon, who is looking for her father, who has apparently gone missing. So we mission impossible our way into the courtyard, and that's where we find him. Talon's been murdered! Thankfully, using the egg of courage that Malon gifted to us, it hatches into a one-up mushroom, and we're allowed to revive Mario from his grisly fate. He runs off to make his daughter some mac and cheese, and that lets us get into the castle all proper-like through the sewers. Or, I mean, I don't really know what this is. Like, it looks like it could be a sewer, right? I don't know. It, it's just, it stinks. And now begins our siege on Hyrule Castle. It involves more stealth, and I'm not really above telling you that I got caught a couple times, but to be fair, my bright green Santa's Workshop elf costume is pretty conspicuous, so I think getting caught kind of adds to that sense of realism. I actually like this section a lot, despite the 1998 stealth jank mechanic. The game even throws you some rupees here and there to see if, like, you know, you're willing to do a little bit of risk and reward kind of thing. It's just, I'm not really greedy enough to try and fill my tiny wallet with 99 rupees rather than just get through this section and, you know, cut grass outside, because it's probably just as lucrative. Upon my successful breaking and entering attempt, Link stumbles into the garden area and finds none other than Princess Zelda, this game's namesake. Apparently, Zelda already knows who Link is because she's been having a very similar spooky dream. Talk about a quinky dick, right? Or perhaps it's fate, because she launches into a tirade about the goddesses and the Triforce, and I didn't really pay attention much to this cutscene because it looked a lot like what the Deku Tree was telling me and I didn't listen to that either. I guess I'm just allergic to exposition. After that, Zelda points out Ganon through the window and he gives us a really evil smile and other than that, I guess this solidifies our reasoning for going on a conquest to kill this guy. I just wish we kind of had some more backstory before we like launch him into the main villain role, you know, because like, I know he's the main villain of most of the Zelda games and the ones I've played 
they don't really give him very much to go off on. Like, Twilight Princess, he just shows up at the very end and he's the final boss. And it's just like, okay, great. I thought Zant was pretty cool for a while until he was like a little baby bitch about things. Like, my big complaint is that the story is really just happening right now because good versus evil. Like, in Skyward Sword, Demise was really just like, I'ma come back and I'm gonna get you. And now from now on, we just gotta be like, okay, Ganon bad, Link good. Like, the only thing that this guy has done to me up to this point is call me a bitch in my dreams. And, like, I hardly think that's grounds for killing the man. Zelda says we gotta go collect the two other primary colored stones from Death Mountain. Gee, I wonder what happens there and Zora River. After that, Impa plays us a little ditty on her ocarina and tells us to hit up her hometown of Kakariko Village first. And I just gotta ask, what kind of maniac builds a settlement at the base of a volcano called Death Mountain? Like, do they vacation over by murder crevasse? I hear it's wonderful this time of year. After Impa's lesson, we get dropped outside of the castle, and then we make our way over to Kakariko Village, where the main draw is there are a ton of buildings to explore, but I don't really want to right now, because the graveyard seems a lot more interesting. I remember through word of mouth that something of importance happens in the graveyard at some point, but I couldn't find anything upon my first visit, so instead, I'm going to Death Mountain, and maybe that'll lead me back to the graveyard at some point, because I still think hiking up Death Mountain is probably not the smartest idea. Really unfortunate to note, on the way up the mountain we run to more spiders, and I'm just saying it's too soon, game. Spiders literally just killed my dad. Higher still on the mountain, we finally run into the friendly rock giants known as the Gorons. And I guess they choose to live on Death Mountain because the rocks up here taste pretty good. And look, guys, I eat like garbage almost on the daily, so I have no right to judge you for your eating habits. But like, there's probably a McDonald's like two minutes away. Wouldn't a Happy Meal be a little bit like more tasty? There might be like a Despicable Me toy in there or something. I bet that would taste better than a rock. Before we can get access to that red stone we need, apparently the Gorons are going through a bit of a problem because the rocks in Dodongo's caverns are their favorite and lately it's been impossible to get at those because of King Dodongo and all of his various Dodong children. Gonna butt in again here though because the cavern is called Dodongo's Caverns. So it sounds to me like the Gorons are the interlopers. So I don't know guys, maybe you guys should like respect their wishes, but you know, Link is an impressionable child, so he agrees to kill the giant lizard. Doesn't really matter, I guess. It was at this point in the game I realized that exploring the different locales we've seen so far elicit very different emotions in me. Like, for example, exploring Castle Town was cool, but like, I've been to a town before. I live in a town. But when you go up Death Mountain, and I'm suddenly in an intricate cave society with big rock golem people and, you know, torches lighting everything because there's no electricity, like, I feel like I am, like, exploring something new because I have never been in that position in the real world. And spoilers, Zora's domain is very much like that as well, you know, because I don't know about you guys, I don't have gills, so I would be a real fish out of water in a situation like this. And I guess since we're in Goron City, I can mention, you know, exploring around this place kind of makes me feel like Anakin Skywalker post-Obi-Wan fight because I think 80 degrees is a little bit too hot for my New England life tastes. Uh, so Goron City would probably... Oh, oh, it's a bit too much. It's like that feeling I get when I record a video for longer than an hour. I just feel like I'm going to waste away. Spoilers, that's what this video is. I'm going to die by the end of this. That's the twist. Looking around Goron City, we come face to face with the leader of the Gorons, Darunia, and he does not want our help with anything because he's a little quanky. Apparently, without his say, we can't go into Dodongo's Cavern because it's pretty dangerous in there on account of the... Dodongos and the, you know, fire and magma everywhere. <laughs> I mean, it's fair. I feel like Darunia has a very realistic response to like a 10 year old kid going, yeah, I wanna go fight the lizards. I guess this means we need to go find a way to cheer him up. And conveniently, if you walk around Goron City, eventually you'll be lured down a certain tunnel thanks to some very catchy music. And I think you know what time it is. Yes, it's the most iconic part of the game. It is the Lost Woods, an area that is a maze that you need to navigate by going towards the tunnel, hearing the music, and you go down the tunnel where the music sounds the loudest. Because at the very center of this area, your friend Saria is jamming out in a forest clearing all on her own. She's like, yeah, I could totally teach you my song and you can play it for whoever you want and, you know, I won't take any credit because she's literally a saint. She's 
like, I don't know, she's probably the best friend that Link could ever have. And I didn't get into this earlier because I was kind of speeding through the very first part, but Saria feels like a very genuine friend to Link. She's the first character you meet right out of the gate, and you get a sense that Saria is someone who actually cares for Link, and therefore, the player. Because, you know, Link is the link between the game and the real world, so... Cool. Thanks, Saria. I really appreciate it. Hopefully I'll see you, you know, at some point, and there's no horrible travesty in between that. <laughs> Using the same area we used to come back to Lost Woods, we head back to Goron City. We play Saria's song for... I almost said Goron. I know his name. His name's Darunia. We play Saria's song for Darunia, and if you don't mind me saying, he, uh... <clears throat> rocks out to it. Having cheered Darunia up, he respects us enough to allow us to enter Dodongo's Caverns. He gives us a little bracelet that lets us, like, play with bombs, because that's safe. I guess he's backpedaled on his previous stance. And now we're in the second dungeon, which is Dodongo's Caverns, because I wanted to say it again. It's so much fun to say. So this one's a bit of a doozy, because it's filled with boiling hot magma, and that stuff will just destroy your Deku Shield instantly if you're not careful, because it's made of wood. Uh, so unless you picked up the Hillian shield from the store back in Castletown, you're probably going to be a little defenseless here and there. But you know, also, the Hillian shield is not super useful either, because as Young Link, all you're allowed to do is sort of like roleplay as a turtle. And I gotta be honest, I don't have very much experience doing that, so it's not really a big help. I kind of don't like that it's so easy to lose your Deku shield like this, but you know, I mean, it makes sense for the realism part of the game, but you know, like, I'm a Peter Pan cosplayer fighting giant lizards in a magma dungeon. Like, realism kind of went out the window, like, a while ago. Like, I'd say when, you know, like, the giant tree started talking to me. <laughs> this dungeon's a lot less linear than the first one, which means I, of course, got lost a couple times, but using the map, the compass, and my eyes, I was able to find a few things that I was missing, including the bomb bag, which allows you to stop using the bomb plants, and use your own stash of bombs, so you can do things like bomb oh, some Dodongos, <laughs> uh, and also drop bombs into the giant uh, skeleton's eyes, because that opens up the way it came to Dodongos' chamber. So I know I've made it clear that I don't like spiders, but at least that situation resolved itself fairly quickly. In this position, I've realized that I'm not well equipped to deal with gigantic Katamari dinosaurs. And also, it's a lot less straightforward than I expected. I figured I would just throw the bomb at him and he would open his mouth because he thought it was like a sweet tart or something. But no, man. I have to wait till he's shooting fire at me and then you throw the bomb in there and he's like... <clears throat> oh, hold on. I guess my reasoning uh, relied on my impatience at first. Because he can lead the Dodongo to Pop Rocks. You cannot make it drink the Pepsi afterwards. That is the thing that he has to do on his own. After causing severe internal damage to this creature, he rolls into the lava and passes away peacefully. <laughs> and we receive another heart container, which brings me up to five. Uh, I'm gonna be mainly getting heart containers from the bosses because I didn't do a, like a ton of exploring. I'm saving that for another playthrough. But I did finish the game with a lot of hearts, just so you know. Back outside, Link realizes why this is called Death Mountain in the first place, as all of the Gorons celebrating his victory, and they want to give him a big old hug. But, you know, I'm not really excited to see what a hydraulic press like that could do to a Hillian body, so Link runs away to go see Darunia and get the Sacred Stone of Fire, or whatever we're calling it. I'm just gonna call it the Red Stone. In addition to receiving the Red Stone, though, Darunia actually tells us that he respects us a great deal, we're the hero of the Gorons, and he makes us his honorary brother. And I gotta say, that actually got a pretty genuine smile out of me. I was really happy that I, you know, helped this dude out and made sure his people weren't gonna starve to death. Um, I like this character a lot. Darunia is a good man, and now we are able to go to Zora's Funtime Water Park or anywhere else in Hyrule Field if we see fit. So I chose to look around a little bit. So like any sane person, I see something smack dab in the middle of the map, and I say, that looks pretty interesting, it must be there for a reason, and when I run over there, it is Lon Lon Ranch, the home of Malin and Talon from earlier. So meeting back up with them again is nice, they are very appreciative of what I did, and I'm able to play a small mini game with Talon, which I just like pick up chickens until he says that I'm pretty cool. Uh, I also got to meet Plot Relevant Pony and learn her song from Melon. 
And uh, that'll be useful later, I suppose. Uh, also, Waluigi is here, but not Luigi or Wario, so um, cut content, I guess? I guess they're saving that for Ura Zelda. <laughs> Still waiting. <clears throat> that'll piss someone off. All right, enough horsing around. We gotta go to Zora's public domain. On the way, a friendly chicken helps me grab yet another heart piece. I'm sure you know how these work by now, but four of them combine to form Voltron, thus giving me another heart container. Arriving finally at Zora's domain, of course, there is a lot of water, which means that we can't go a lot of places yet because we are but a small child. Uh, something is a bit fishy around here, though, because apparently Princess Rudo is M.I.A., and her father is in a bit of a tizzy over that. Not to mention their gargantuan fish beast guardian Jabu Jabu apparently has some weird stuff going on, and I can't imagine any of these things are related in any way. But you know, it doesn't really matter to me because I'm earning 99 rupees a day by working from home, and you can talk to this Zora to find out how. So after I get paid and receive the silver scale so I can dive deeper into the water, Link heads down to a weird cave entrance, and he emerges at Lake Hylia, where he finds a bottle. This is no joke. These things are super rare and valuable in this universe because, like, you can put anything in these things. You can put a little fairy in a bottle, and if you die, it'll resurrect you on the spot. And that's why they're so rare, presumably. Like, you can't even buy these things, because, I mean, I guess you can't just hand these things out to just anybody. Not only is it a bottle, there's actually also, like, a used gum wrapper in there with a note on it from Rudo that says, Oh my god, help me. I'm inside Lord Jabu Jabu. And that's awful. That's, that's really sad, I guess. I'm gonna help, though, because Rudo has the spiritual stone I'm looking for, and that is the only reason. Obviously, we then go show this note to King Zora, and he moves his feet so he loses his seat. Sorry, them's the bricks. Out in the back of Zora's domain, we come across the head-empty Goliath himself, Lord Jabu Jabu, who's just kind of sitting there staring. And Link stares back into the void, and... I don't know if maybe they're both silent protagonists, so they're kind of communicating in some special way that we just can't fathom. Or I guess he was just hungry, I guess, because you drop a fish in front of that sucker and it's all over for Link. This is the end of the game. All right, here we are in the third dungeon. It's Lord Jabu Jabu's belly. I guess he's got a rumbly in his tumbly somewhere. So objective one, we're going to find Princess Rudo. Objective two, we're getting the H out of here because ew, fish guts. So pretty quickly I learned what is causing Jabu Jabu's distress and it turns out that someone has twisted his entire internal organ structure into a Zelda dungeon, and I think that would make anybody cranky. Strap in though, fellas, because this one gets a little bit wild. Like, I'm talking up and down and all around. This place has a lot of places to go, and if you're not paying attention, you might get lost. But thankfully, when you first get here, it is very easy to tell where you're supposed to go first, because there are a lot of barriers blocking entrances to different areas. Pretty quickly after we enter the dungeon, we find Princess Rudo herself, who refuses to come with us initially because it's not like she likes us or anything. Uh, but then she kind of backpedals on that, as long as Link will carry her around. And thus begins my disdain for royalty. At the very least, she does help you with a couple puzzles because you can put her down on switches, and then sure, Link goes in to risk his life to, you know, grab the boomerang and other little trinkets, but, you know, thanks, Rudo. A lot of help sitting out there and then berating me because I, you know, went and risked my life to get us out of here. That is a huge relief. I finally found the map. Now I won't get lost inside of Jabu Jabu. Hold on. Who... Did Ganon put this map here for me? Did he... Did he cartography this entire fish for me? Because that's strangely nice of him, and also... Man, he's got some strange hobbies. Using the new boomerang, Link is able to cut down a lot of these colorful tendrils, opening up more passages deeper into Jabu Jabu so we can try and figure out what's going on. And I'd just like to point out, this is actually the second living thing we've been inside of in this game that has a dungeon attached to it. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of people forget that the Deku Tree was indeed alive at one point. Not anymore. But I guess it's easy to forget because the Deku Tree doesn't have giant gnashing spike teeth. Because if he did, uh... I think the Kokiri would have been on their own. You can get Mido or like an exorcist to do it, guys. It's not my problem. After a little bit more bumbling around, Bruto notices that up on this clearly obvious trap platform, the spiritual stone of water is chilling. So thinking strategically, Link throws Ruto onto the platform to activate it, 
Thus bringing us the next mini boss encounter, Big Octo, which is actually my least favorite encounter in the entire game. I'm sure there's probably some better way to do this than what I was doing. You can throw the boomerang to stun him so you can run up and hit him and it, it's just such a huge pain because you think when you're running to chase him, you want to like get as close to the interior of the chamber as possible. But psych, that platform has spikes on it now. So if you touch that, you get hurt. And if you run around the outside, you're too slow. So like basically, I just kept brute forcing things until this thing finally died, and I was just really angry the entire time I was doing it. Not fun, but at least Princess Ruto is gone, Link's plan worked. But there is the small problem that we do need the Sacred Stone of Water still, so I guess we gotta go track her down again. After curb stomping Jabu Jabu's appendix, we eventually make it to Baronade, the giant boss of this area. And I don't know if it was the dungeon's layout, or maybe just me playing the game for too long. I don't know, Navi keeps telling me, hey, if you need a break, please stop. But I was like seriously worn down and very ready to euthanize this fish by the time I got here. I originally thought that this thing was actually Jabu Jabu's heart and I was like, oh, no wonder he's a little bit upset. His heart is uh, <laughs> a spinning death machine that spawns jellyfish. But I'm pretty sure this is just some kind of crazy parasite because you beat the heck out of this thing. Rudo is safe and on the outside of Jabu Jabu, she gives us the spiritual stone of water, which apparently is only supposed to be given to her future husband. Uh, so I take the stone and I plan to never come back here ever because gross fish. You don't need a fiance, you need counseling. Finally, we have all three of the spiritual stones. So we head back to Hyrule Castle, but oh no, our dream is coming true. Zelda and Impa are running away on a horse Ganon comes out, flashes his beautiful crest white strip smile at us before shooting a piss orb at us from his hand. And uh, before Zelda runs off, she kind of throws us an ocarina and ooh, that's kind of that's cool. I like that one. Let me just throw away this one with huge sentimental value made by our oldest and dearest friend because this one can turn back time and make it rain or something. And I don't mean make it rain like money, but like, you know, it literally makes it rain. And I, like, I don't know why I want to do that. I mean, talk about raining on someone's parade, right? Maybe like Mido, that'd be a good use for that. This again, though, I made a joke about, you know, Link just throws away his old ocarina. But like, imagine if Saria was like at Hyrule 7-Eleven and she saw her ocarina in the trash and like, Sure, she's got like a raspberry slushy, but it's not gonna totally fix the heartbreak she'd feel from seeing that there. And that is why I don't justify Link's actions. I don't care if the Ocarina of Time has magical powers. I am loyal. Wasting no time, Link rushes to the Temple of Time, throws the three stones on the table, and rushes into the main chamber where one lone sword stays stuck in the ground. And this, my friends, is the Master Sword. Legend has it the only weapon that can completely destroy evil. Aside from one other thing that I will mention in a little while, please remember this exact moment because it'll be a funny payoff. Link moves to the middle of the chamber and pulls the master's- I have one, hold on. Link stands at the ready, pulls the master sword from its resting place, and then Ganondorf walks in right after him and sort of just walks into the sacred realm because Psyche, he was waiting for that. Talk about you know, pulling the sword out of the stone, he pulled the rug out from under us. But it doesn't really matter much because, you know, we'll just take this beauty and we'll hit him with it a couple times and we'll be just fine. Hey, you. You're finally awake. So Psyche again, apparently pulling the sword out of the stone like that, put Link into a coma until he was old enough to make a Club Penguin account without his parents' permission. So if I have this correct, the powers that be thought Link was a little too young to fight Ganondorf as he was, which I call bullshit on because I've seen Majora's Mask and he kind of kicks butt in that game. So instead they thought it was a better idea to seal Link away for seven plus years and allow Ganondorf to just destroy everything and become even more powerful in the meantime. And what does Link get? He gets like a special sword and teenage angst, but mostly just the teenage angst. Like, come on, I think maybe they should have had a little more faith in this dude. He's already conquered three dungeons on his own. According to Rauru here, our job is to go out back into the world of the future and find all of his fellow sages while he just kind of sits here and vibes. I mean, I'm just saying, dude, if we split this work in two, it would happen a lot faster. But you know, whatever, that wouldn't make for a very fun experience, now would it? 
Exiting the Sage Cage, Link comes face to face with a newcomer. They say their name is Sheik, and they're here to challenge us to a 1v1 final destination with no items. Link politely tells Sheik that he doesn't have time for this, and also he only plays unmodded Super Smash Bros. Brawl, thus causing Sheik to run away in fear. Hopefully he doesn't trip on the way out. I also think it's kind of funny that Sheik mentions the location of every single Sage, meaning we could literally split this work three ways and it would be even faster, but I guess in the past seven years, common sense died out. Sheik gently tells us that we should probably go to the forest temple first because we have an old friend waiting for us there, and you better believe I'm going to see my friend Saria. But wouldn't it be kind of f***ed up if we got there and it was my dog? <laughs> like, I would probably leave him behind there. Like, we could probably handle this without him. But before we go, we have to go pick up a special item from Kakariko Village, and then Sheik kind of just stands there being very, very helpful. Thank you so much, dude. We finally emerge from the Temple of Time back into Castletown, and oh my goodness! This place has really gone to the dogs, or lack thereof, because that little dog that was running around before isn't here anymore. This place sucks now. Putting the zombified villagers aside, because who really gives a shit? I run over to Lon Lon Ranch because Malin and Talon are some of the characters I care the most about so far, and I want to see what happened to them in this weirdo Twilight Zone world. And you know, that brings up a good point, right? Because, like, you always have villains that are like, I'm going to rule the world, and, and you know, it's covered in fire and death and destruction. But, like, why would you want to rule a world that's all barren and destroyed and disgusting? Like, wouldn't you want to rule a world that's all cushy and really nice just for you? Like, it reminds me of this one episode of the Powerpuff Girls from forever ago, where Mojo Jojo actually takes over the town, and everyone's like, oh my god, this is gonna be awful! But he literally turns it into a utopia, because, like, he wants to rule over a really nice city with no problems. And everyone's like, huh. Okay, I guess I'm okay with this. But then he freaks out because it's too quiet, so then they go back to the status quo. But, like, that makes sense to me. You know, you want to rule over something nice. But Ganon's over here, turning the entire castle town into zombies and shit. And it's like, is a zombie really gonna listen to you? No, dude. It's gonna chomp you, and then you're a zombie. Looks like you f***ed up. Down at Lon Lon Ranch, apparently in the time skip, Ganon has given ownership of the ranch to Ingo and kicked Talon out to God knows where. Malin is still here to take care of our four-legged friends because someone has to. And obviously Ingo is only in it for the profits, so, you know, she's gotta protect these guys. If we go in there and we play the song Malin taught us forever ago, Plot Relevant Pony, now Plot Relevant Horse, shows up. Taking Ingo on in two different races because he is a sore loser, he decides, hey yeah, you can have that horse if you want it so bad, but I'm gonna close all the doors so you can't get out. But you know, he kind of forgot that he was raising horses that are built to jump over very high gates. So all we do is take the back exit, and that's, that's game, dude. Sorry, Epona and Link back together, the dream team. This really had me wishing that we could, like, reinstate Malin or Talon even as the owner of the ranch, but my thought was, I'll check back here later and see if I can do that. And then I never went back for the rest of the playthrough, because I forgot. So anyway, we head to Kakariko Village, and I guess seven years was long enough for Dompe the Gravekeeper to die, which means we can dig up whatever graves that we want and no one's there to stop us. Score. Apparently the grave that we're supposed to dig up is actually Dompe's grave himself, and him as a ghost, like, challenges us to a weird race, but it's not really a race because we're just supposed to follow him. And then at the end of the path, he gives us the hook shot, which is one of my favorite items in the game, aside from uh, something else that we'll get later. I should mention I also found the sun song in the graveyard earlier, and that allows you to cycle the time of day whenever you want, and it's useful for trying to get to different NPCs, because sometimes they only show up in certain times. But it's nothing super in-depth like the sequel, thankfully. Thankfully, Epona lets you get through Hyrule Field a lot quicker, and before long we're back in Kokiri Forest, which definitely isn't looking too good, because I guess the death of the Deku Tree and then the rise of Ganon have had a pretty big effect on the place. It's honestly a huge shame, because there are monsters in what used to be a really peaceful little village, and the Kokiri just have no choice but to stay in their homes and keep to themselves, and... It feels really petty of Ganon to, like, fuck with these guys, because they literally can't leave the forest or they'll die. So, like, 
Why bother? I feel like that's a big enough deterrent. I don't think they're gonna get in his way. You can talk to some Kokiri around town and they don't recognize Link because he is super tall and cool now, as opposed to when he was really short and a loser before. Tracking through the Lost Woods again, we find Mido, who's actually blocking off entrance to the Forest Temple to protect Saria, which, you know what, I can actually respect. I guess seven years did actually change this guy a little bit. Link plays Saria's song for him, he recognizes that this must be a friend of Saria's, and he lets Link go by, not realizing that he's actually Link. Uh, and it's, it's still kind of sad that all the people Link knew when he was a kid just don't know him anymore. It's like, that, that'd be really stressful for me, I think. Heading back down the way we went before, we have to stealth kill all these huge dudes, and then we get to the point where we found Saria before, and this is where Sheik appears, just kind of teleporting in, I guess, because Sheik knows a song that lets you teleport directly to the Sacred Grove, which I don't think I used even one time after I got it. Which is interesting, because some of these teleportation songs are really useful later on. Gotta hand it to you, Sheik, you really know when to pop in in the most convenient timing. Because, like, if you had shown up about five minutes earlier, I wouldn't have had to deal with Mido again. I would have just kind of teleported in and just started doing the dungeon. But all joking aside, I really, really like these little concerts that Sheik and Link do, because Sheik pulls out the harp, and Link pulls out the ocarina, and they just jam out, and it's so gorgeous and cinematic, and... I just imagined what it must have been like in 1998 seeing something like that that wasn't like a movie. Like, you're actually a part of this. You're, I mean, it's a cutscene, so you're not doing it. But that's you right there. You're Link. Because Link between the players. It's cool. I like it a lot, and there's a lot of them in this game. And honestly, I would watch those on YouTube again any day. I said it, you know, until Nintendo takes down every single piece of their music. Uh, from the platform, and then doesn't let you listen to them anywhere else. Thanks, guys. All right, it's temple time, but forest temple, not time temple. Now, unlike the Deku Tree, this place is a straight-up nightmare that I actually hate a lot. I don't hate the atmosphere, however, because it has this really strong elegiac aura to it, which I really got into. But even with the map, I was running around the same rooms trying to find where I was supposed to go because there are so many little entrances and exits you can miss. And this is the part of it where I was like, man, did I make a mistake trying to play this game? But I kept going because I'm not a huge bitch. I'm just a s small one. But for real, I never thought I'd miss Jabu Jabu's Belly Dungeon because that was like a lot more fun than this one. Sure, there are some really amazing set pieces like that one hallway that like, twists and that actually changes the orientation of the room you go into, which means you can get to different areas from it. But that also contributed to my confusion, because I was like, do I get to this area from the regular room where it's twisty, or do I get to the, the, the area with, where it's straight and you can just go right down the hallway? I don't know, man. All I know is it was pretty easy to find the ghosts, at least, but everything else was a huge pain in the ass, because until you find the fairy bow, you were basically just running around like a chicken with its head cut off. And you know, it's a really good thing I find the fairy bow in this dungeon because you can't use the slingshot when Link is an adult. Don't know why, but you know, I mean, like, no more slingshot for me, I guess I'm full. Once you defeat all four of those poses, you're able to take the central elevator down to one last quick puzzle before you get to this dungeon's boss, which is Phantom Ganon, who is like the regular Ganon, except he's made out of ghost instead of muscle. I like this fight a lot because it's basically just more practice for the fairy bow. You just aim the bow and you look around for Ganon while he's running through these paintings and you snipe him before he can get you and eventually the ghost is defeated and in a weird turn of events that shows maybe just a flex of Ganondorf's power, he projects his voice from wherever the hell he is all the way to the forest temple and is like, dude, you killed my ghost, LMAO. I'm putting this thing in the rift between dimensions. I'll see you later. And in my head, I was like, that, that sounds like a really big power he's got there. Like, if he could just trap something in between dimensions, and I don't want it to be me next, so I think I'm going to give up on the quest. But then I remember that Ganon cheated to get to where he's at now, and I don't really like that very much. I'm an honorable man, so I am going to roll up to that castle and remove the Triforce of Power from his hand with my Master Exacto Knife. He's going to wish he was Phantom Ganon by the time I'm done with him. Link grabs another heart container, growing stronger yet, and then reunites with Saria, who is actually the Forest Sage. Though I don't know why I said it like that, because we definitely already knew. Unfortunately, Saria is not able to come back to the real world with she has to stay in the Sage Dimension with Rauru to help seal off Ganon once it's time, but she gives us the Forest Medallion and wishes us good luck. Thank you, my friend. I really appreciate it. Back outside the Sage Dimension, 
Link arrives in front of the dead Deku Tree, who is still in fact dead. And then Link gets yet another surprise in the form of Baby Deku Tree, newest show on ABC television. Spin off, I hate, you know when our networks are like, we're gonna make the baby version of this show, Baby Muppets, Baby Toll Drama Island, I think I saw it. Like, why? Is it because you have no other ideas? Is it because you're a baby yourself, Mr. TV Executive? Or is that maybe it? But this sprout is actually the Deku Tree given new life, like a reincarnation, since Ganon's evil is finally out of the forest. And as a thank you, I guess he decided that he would jump scare us like that. And like, what if Link had had a heart attack? Like, who knows what seven years of cryo sleep does to a human heart? You know, Link could have just immediately just gone into like a myocardiac infarction or something. After this fun encounter with dear old dad, we run back to the Temple of Time where Sheik says, hey, if you want to go back to being a child, you can put the Master Sword back in the pedestal. And that makes me wonder if Link can like feel himself shrinking and growing like the Animorphs do. Like, have you ever read Animorphs and seen how they describe their transformations? Like, that shit sounds horrifying. Sheik also takes this time to teach us the prelude of light, and that, my friends, lets us warp back to the Temple of Time whenever we want. And that just makes me really happy, because backtracking is getting a lot easier. Like, soon Epona is just not even going to be necessary, because we can just, whoop, turn the balls of light and fly away. Though Sheik maybe could have given me that, like, as soon as I got to the future, because, you know, I did have to run back here, like, twice already. But you know, potatoes, potatoes. I'm mad. Sheik does his usual disappearing thing, and then bada bing, bada boom, we're going back to Death Mountain. Thank God. So this is where things get a little bit annoying for me, where I actually had to bust out a guide, because I remembered seeing the red tunic in the shop in Goron City in the past. So I went to Goron City in the future, and that shop is closed off. So I think, okay, I guess since Sheik just told me that I can go back to the past whenever I want, I have to go back to the past and buy the Goron tunic. So I go back to the past, go to Death Mountain, go to buy the Goron tunic, but it's 200 rupees, and I don't have enough, I can't carry enough of my tiny idiot baby wallet. So I go back to the future, and then I go find the adult wallet, which thankfully I was able to get because I had enough sculptulas at the time, go back to the past again, go to buy the thing after harvesting a bunch of rupees, and the Goron at the shop says, sorry, I can't sell this to you yet. And I'm sure some people are sitting there in the comments now yelling at me, you're supposed to throw a bomb at this Goron in the future, and then he just gives it to you for free. And let me tell you why that was not ever going to come up in my logic. One, I didn't see the baby Goron rolling around. Two, I saw him eventually and talked to him, and he wouldn't stop. Three, my instinct would not be to then throw a bomb at him to get him to stop moving. That makes me think that I just can't do anything with this, that I need to go find the tunic or, you know, do what I already did. This is one of those parts of the game that I didn't like very much, because I was like, I don't think there's any way I would have come to that conclusion on my own, because I'm not a f***ing maniac who just throws bombs around all willy-nilly and hoping that something will happen. Like, I throw bombs at walls when they're cracked, that's what the game taught me. They've never had me do that with an NPC before. So that's where I stand on that part. Moving on, I guess. Getting back to this little Goron, this is actually Darunia's son, Link, which is actually super adorable. Like, I had to stop and just kind of like smile at that for a bit. Like, Darunia respects and cares about Link that much that he literally named his kid after Link because he helped the Gorons in that day and then just disappeared forever. And he was just like, I need to pay tribute. It was just really sweet. So Link says to Link that all of the Gorons have been captured and they're gonna be fed to this dragon named Volvagia in the Fire Temple. And Darunia has gone over there to try and save them because that's just what he do. Pledging that we will help him because, you know, we're Link, the hero of legend. He gives us the red tunic. He opens the shop back up in case we need anything. And we head over to the Fire Temple to go help Darunio with that stuff. With the red tunic on now, Link can now survive the hot magma environment of the Fire Temple, which usually he was not able to. It's kind of like when you wear sweatpants, so you're immune to sweat. Though here I kind of messed up again because I went back up to the top of the mountain where I thought the dungeon was, threw bombs around for a while because I was trying to break some rocks, and then I realized I must have missed some dialogue about entering the dungeon through Darunia's secret tunnel entrance in his room. And that's on me, because I probably missed what the Goron Link said. But also... I'm... Blech. 
Once I get to the right area, Sheik shows up to tell me I'm an idiot and then plays some hot beats on the on the harp. I don't know what I was... I would, I would hold a harp like this, I think, because I'm right-handed. And we learn the Bolero of Fire, which lets us warp back to Goron City, specifically the Fire Temple area, whenever we want. Uh, I used this one a bit until I got a different song, but it is useful. The Fire Temple is... okay. It's not, like, the worst thing in the world, it's not my favorite thing in the world. Basically, what we do here is we run around in different areas, there are a bunch of firewalls that spring up that stop you from going certain directions, and you gotta find your way around everything. And then we find Darunia, who is over near the boss door and says, Hey, I need you to go free all the Gorons while I go take out the dragon. Because, you know, the dragon's gonna eat them, just like they eat the rocks from the mountain. And I guess the rock is on the other foot now, huh, Gorons? So in this dungeon, we do go around to a bunch of different rooms and free Gorons by hitting switches, and they all, like, waddle out of their cages all funny-like. Eventually, we find the main item for this dungeon, which is the Megatron Hammer. And that thing is actually pretty fun to use, uh, except for a lot of the time, because it's sort of a shitty weapon. And I'm sorry about that, but it's really, it's really situational. Like, it must do a lot of damage, I just didn't really end up using it in most combat. Once you have the hammer, you're able to finally get back to where Darunia was and enter the boss room, where Vilvagia is waiting. And Darunia is not there for whatever reason, so I, of course, fear the worst and jump into combat with this dragon. It's here I realize that this thing is super tiny and skinny, and I don't see how it could ever eat a Goron. So basically, I probably could have just let it try to eat one, it probably would have choked and died. And that would have been the end of the Fire Temple. But anyway, we get to play a fun game of whack-a-mole whenever this guy pops out of a hole, and you just like, dush, 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 until he dies, and it's really not difficult at all. But it is kind of fun. Grabbing yet another heart container and jumping into the blue portal. Surprise, Darunia is the Sage of Fire. And this is the second time that our friend has just disappeared in a temple like this now, so I'm starting to see a pattern. Darunia mentions that Link is now the savior of the Gorons two times over, reaffirms that he is a total bro and he cares about him and we're good friends. And I love this character, he's my favorite character in this game, guaranteed. We get the Medal of Fire and now we're on to do something else. Oh god, whatever could that be? Knowing that my options at this point were sort of slim, I decided that I'd go to Gerudo Valley first because I'd rather dance than drown. Little did I know I'd also come face to face with a new favorite area, but it's a favorite area that I also hate a little bit. This is the Gerudo Fortress, and the first thing that happens here is Link is thrown in prison because he is not a woman. Uh, that's how the Gerudo roll. Apparently there's only one male Gerudo born every hundred years, and that was Ganondorf, so he is the king, but he is also an asshole. So now it's time for a good old jailbreak segment where Link has to escape from his confinement and then sneak around the entire base with more 1998 jank stealth. And let me tell you, this is the part that I both love and hate because I think every time I got caught, it was definitely my fault for not paying attention, but also I got caught a million times, so I kept getting frustrated. But basically, you just need to sneak around. There are also some other people imprisoned here, so you go free all of them one by one, fight a Gerudo soldier who was the exact same fight every single time, which is kind of a missed opportunity. And then once you get through all of these guys, one of the Gerudo just shows up and is like, Hey man, you're actually pretty cool for sneaking through this place and like, sniping people with arrows from the back of the head. And they're not dead, but you know, like they sure look like they're f***ing dead on the ground for a while. But anyway, you can just walk around here whenever you want now. And I gotta say, this is part of the reason I love it so much, because it actually feels like I accomplished something here. Like I went from being like public enemy number one, to at least like three or four maybe because now I can just walk around and they're my friends. They also mentioned something about a Gerudo training ground so I run in there and it's basically like a mini dungeon where you do a whole bunch of little tasks and uh, I would go more into detail about this but I go through about six or seven rooms getting keys thinking I can complete it before I realize I need more items and then I forget to go back for the rest of the game. So that mystery will remain a mystery until I replay this game again, and you better believe I will be playing it again at some point. You gotta wonder, though, how the Gerudo are so forgiving, because, like, I mentioned before, you can shoot them with arrows, and they kind of, like, fall down and stop moving for a while. And I, I feel like maybe Link should be in prison for that. But all is forgiven, I guess. So with very little options left, and now being forced into a corner, I had no choice but to head for Zora's Domain, which is the big scary thing that you always hear people talk about with this game. It is the Water Temple. 
and I really wasn't ready, and uh, apparently neither was my 3DS capture card, because it was at this point that, after four years of being an absolute king and Chad, it just stopped working. So that put me in a little bit of a bind, because uh, I was playing the game on this because I wanted it to be genuine, and uh, the only options that left me with was either using emulation or canceling the video, and I was about, like, 28 pages into the script at this point, so uh, you better believe I'm not just canceling the video. Also, I just wanted to show you that it does still work, it just doesn't capture anymore, which uh, was the main reason I had this thing in the first place, but at least the console itself still works, so that's something. Now, some people are going to say I should have used Tisher to begin with, but I argue I was trying to get a more genuine experience by having the gyro controls and stuff. But uh, seeing the nice texture pack that I was able to apply to the game, and the nice 1080p resolution, and the very few visual or sound issues, uh, I was wrong to, to use the 3DS. I should have definitely just used this from the beginning. And I don't know if people are going to complain about a, like, graphical upgrade for the rest of the video, but if you have a problem with the graphics going from 240p to 1080p, please uh, let me know in the comments, I guess? I, I, I'm i sorry, I, I really didn't have any other choice. With these shiny new graphics, I decided to go over to Zoro's Domain finally, and it seems like I'm getting the cold shoulder here, because everyone is frozen, maybe I shouldn't make jokes, they are actually probably in mortal danger. The king is even on ice, and not like a fun skating show, I mean. I mean, like, he is probably legally dead. But that serves him right for that annoying shit he pulled earlier with the slow moving across the screen. Heading outside again, we can see that Lord Jabu Jabu is mysteriously gone, and I can confidently say that nothing of value was lost. Using the newly formed ice floats as platforms, I head over into the ice cave, which is a mini dungeon based around ice physics and ice gimmicks. And everybody loves those, right? Uh, but real talk, this one is not too bad, and I actually have some interesting news to report about this part. So I typically hate ice-themed levels, but as I was playing through this area, there was this weird feeling welling up inside of me, and it wasn't gas this time. It was actually joy. As I was running through this place, and solving puzzles, and getting stuck, I was having a really, really good time. And up until this point, I hadn't really experienced that same feeling, and I don't know if it was because I was really digging the dungeon, or if something was finally clicking with me. But as I was running through this pristine, glistening paradise of a level, and I finally got to the last room that was filled with all these gorgeous crystals, it hit me, right here, that I was actually feeling it. I was feeling the magic that everyone always talks about. Everyone says this game is one of the most impressive and amazing experiences in the world. And I was like, yeah man, I bet. But have you ever played Mario 64? Well, that's still a magical game that I love. But this game finally hit me. It finally broke through that skepticism shell that I had around my heart. And to this point, I can confidently say that I love this game. I think I actually love this game a whole lot, and I really want to play it again. Because even now when I'm talking about it, it makes me want to go back and play it again, even though I just finished it. Like, I want to go to every nook and cranny of this entire world that they made, and I want to find everything. Because I... I'm, I'm getting, like, chills thinking about it. I'm like, oh my god, I gotta go find all the heart pieces, I gotta do the mask side quest, I gotta plant all those magic beans! It's gonna be great. It's gonna be amazing, and I know it will be now because I do love this game. It's in this room where I found my love for this game that I also find the Iron Boots, which are going to be essential for the next part of the game I'm not excited about, and Sheik shows up to give us the song to teleport to Lake Hylia. Hylia, Hylia. Well, I've been saying it different ways the whole time. I'm so sorry. This is my favorite of the little, like, Sheik music things because, like, this area is so gorgeous, and I know the texture pack makes it look even nicer. But even if I wasn't using that, I think I would still very much be enamored with this entire scene. Before we warp over to Lake Hylia, though, we take some of the blue fire we've been using throughout this mini dungeon, and we go saute King Zora until he's nice and crisp. In response, he gives us the blue tunic, 
which I will now never take off because Blue Link is the best Link. And you can even ask Nintendo, they'll say the same thing. Just look at Breath of the Wild. His entire costume is different. It's not green. All right, enough stalling. We warp to Lake Hylia. We find the Water Temple. And I'm going in there and I'm going to conquer this thing. And let me tell you, even though I've heard it's the worst thing in the world, one of the most frustrating things in gaming, uh, it actually was not that bad. People are over-exaggerating a little bit. The only place where I had a problem that caused me a lot of backtracking time was because I messed something up, not because of the dungeon. And I'll tell you exactly what that was. So basically when you get in here, the gimmick is that you can have the water in the temple at three different levels at any given time, and you can change that by going to certain areas and playing your ocarina. I really wish they had just let me hit a button or something, because that was really annoying to play Zelda's lullaby over and over and over and over again. But at the very beginning of the dungeon, you go down to the bottom, you go into a certain area, and oh my god, it's Princess Rudo, and we're engaged. I forgot about that, because I was out saving the world. But anyway, she says, hey, follow me, we're gonna go up there to the water switch. And then she vanishes, and I wonder what happened to her. Surely she did not just become a sage and get captured. But that's the part where I messed up, because on that initial ascent to the first water switch, you find a room in between the two rooms where there is a cracked wall that you need to bomb later. I totally forgot about that. So I proceeded with the dungeon as normal. The idea of this dungeon, to make it as easy as possible, is you lower the water level, you do everything on the bottom floor, you get it to the midsection, you do everything there and get the secret that's located in the central tower, then you raise it to the top and do everything there. But my problem was I was missing one key because of that bombable wall, so I was completely stuck and bumbled around for like 45 minutes trying to figure out what to do. So that's on me. If I had that key, Water Temple would have been the easiest time I think I had in the entire game so far. But finally having that key lets you get into the area where we're going to go get the long shot, my beloved. But first, we actually have to fight a mini boss, which I think is the coolest in the entire game, which would be Dark Link. See, I remember this room from all the controversy online, like the Nintendo Switch thing, because they were like, oh my god, they made it ugly. And for some reason, I did not put together that that was going to be in the Water Temple even though the floor is entirely water. Um, but anyway, you fight Dark Link, he shows up, he does the same moves you do. I really, really dig how when you slash at him sometimes, he just jumps up on your sword, again, like, like some kind of Peter Pan thing, and then he hits you with his sword. And it was so much fun to figure out, but I did end up getting frustrated and just kind of started mashing buttons, and eventually he just died. So it wasn't the most frustrating or difficult fight, but... I do like what it was, so like I like everything about it aside from the actual gameplay, I guess. So from there we pick up the long shot, we can go back to a couple other areas where we needed the long shot, and then we're just headed to the boss of the dungeon, which is Morpha, a gigantic amoeba thing that you need to use the hook shot, long shot, to pull the brain out of and just give it some sword stabs. Always fun to put an amoeba in its place, you know? After defeating Morpha, we head back to the Sage Room, and of course, Princess Rudo is our Sage of Water, because who else would it have been? She mentions that Link has earned her eternal love, but, you know, probably can't be with him at this point because she has to be a Sage, so she'll give him the Water Medallion instead, which is honestly what I prefer, because honestly, my heart belongs to another Zora. I'm very sorry. Back outside the Water Temple, the lake fills back up and thaws out Zora's domain, so everyone's all safe and warm again. That's really great. Sheik also shows up, and Link is always very happy to see Sheik, uh, but Sheik doesn't really want to hang out with Link too much, so Sheik does this really sick dive. I guess it's best to then go and regroup at Kakariko Village, as you do, and uh, it is uh, on fire. Guys, I'm here to regroup. I need you to stop being on fire. It's really throwing off my groove. Also, Sheik is back really quickly this time, and he's getting ready to face off against some invisible creature that's climbing out of the well, and that does not go super well. No pun intended. Link also gets caught up in this, and when he regains consciousness eventually, Sheik is like, hey man, you gotta go into the Shadow Temple now, sorry. And also, you might want to check out what's going on in the well, because there's something in there that you need. But you're not going to be able to get into it right now, so go back in time, okay? Okay. Bye. Uh, Sheik teaches you the... The... Uh, the... 
the Nocturne something, the, the Nocturne Shadow, Shadow Nocturne, I don't remember what it's called. And I didn't write it down in the script. He plays you through the fire and flames or something. <laughs> Whatever. Then I go back to the Temple of Time, come back to Kakariko again with the new song that I can teleport to the graveyard with. And, um... I hate this dungeon a lot. The bottom of the well is, I think, my least favorite dungeon in the entire game. Real talk, I hate this dungeon, like, a lot, because, one thing, I missed something pretty obvious, so it's partially my fault, but also, not a fan of the gimmick here at all, because it's all filled with, like, invisible traps. Like, you could be walking one way, and then all of a sudden you fall into the basement, and you walk by the re-dead, and he screams, but... You know, then he just casually sits back down because you're a little bit too out of his range, so he thinks you're not worth his time. You climb all the way back up to the top, you're running around again, you fall again, and it's, oh my god, I mean, it's made a lot easier because you're supposed to go get the Lens of Truth by fighting the mini-boss, actual Satan, or, you know, as the game calls him, Dead Hand. Uh, I cannot believe this isn't a Nintendo game, by the way. This is actually, like, real creepy factor. I'm not sleeping ever again, I guess. But when you get the Lens of Truth out of this guy's boss room, basically the entire rest of the dungeon becomes a regular dungeon, and I guess that means I kind of played it on hard mode without it? And that's probably why I hate it so much. But you know, taking away the water in that one section did not make my brain correlate back to the beginning of it where I didn't even look into the pit that was in front of me that was filled with water, so... I don't know. I, it's, it's on me, it's not on me... whatever. Once Link climbs back out of hell, we have to go to the Shadow Temple, which we can warp to directly, but there is one thing we need to go find before we go to the Shadow Temple, and it's actually the only thing I knew about before I started playing this game, aside from other iconic things like the Water Temple and the Lost Woods. And that would be, we need to go find Din's Fire. You might be asking, Oh, Dylan, if you've never played this game, uh, what do you know about this? Well, for one thing, a lot of people have played this game. A lot of people I know. And I've had plenty of people tell me, oh man, the Shadow Temple was kind of a bait and switch because I was getting all ready to go in, but oh man, you gotta light all these torches before you can go in. You cannot possibly do it with just fire arrows, which I don't have either. So what you need is Din's fire, and that is basically the only thing I actually remember from everyone talking about it. So hooray for selective listening, I guess. Also, side note, I haven't mentioned this yet, but the Great Fairy is kind of... I don't, I don't even know if we can show that in the video. Like, she's kind of like, Boo. right? Like, <laughs> oh boy, you gotta, gotta like cool off or something. Once we've got Din's fire in our toolkit, we head over to the Shadow Temple, light up all those torches at the same time, and this is basically Hell Part 2, the Hellening. Even though it's definitely not as bad as the bottom of the well. You still rely a lot on the Lens of Truth for a lot of puzzles. Like, in the first chamber, you end up seeing some doorways, and there's also a mechanism you have to turn so it's facing the actual skull, because every other skull in the room is apparently just skull-flavored air. There's also a sign pretty early on that you talk to, and it's like, you cannot cross this gap unless you have the sacred feet. And, like, I'm not even gonna make a joke about that one, because it's just too easy. Do you think Link is on wiki feet? Don't look that up. For this dungeon, it is again pretty straightforward. I think maybe they had a little mercy on you, because you already went through the bottom of the well, and they have a very similar vibe. Like, for instance, the well was all full of hell, and the Shadow Temple is definitely all shadowy and cryptic-y and bloody and evil -y, and all of those Lee words that aren't actually real words. But if you just throw in the lens of truth, this thing basically becomes a regular dungeon just like the bottom of the well. There are some parts that maybe might confuse you here and there, but maybe you throw a bomb here, you look around and use your eyes elsewhere, and I only got stuck in this dungeon one time, so I think that means you should probably be okay, because I just kind of assume everyone else is a little bit better at things than I am. The one thing I wanted to mention here is, towards the very end, there is a novelty pirate ship ride, which I think is kind of neat. It's got, like, all this cool imagery around it, and you kind of, like, float eerily through the rest of the Shadow Temple, and then, oh my god, there's more skeletons here to assert dominance! And oh boy do they, because Link ends up going down with the ship at least once, but you know what? Joke's on them, because a good captain always goes down with their ship. The boss fight of the Shadow Temple is Bongo Bongo, which is one of the stupidest names I've ever heard, so of course he kills the shit out of me almost instantly. This fight's a little bit hard to learn, because he's always slapping the bongo and causing Link to jump up in the air, 
I don't know if using the hover boots helps you with that very much because it does remove like the traction and stuff. But after the first attempt, I went back through the entire Shadow Temple because you got to do that if you get a game over. And on my second try, I discovered his pattern pretty quickly, which was quite the conundrum for him. After this fight, we discover that, of course, Impa is the Sage of Shadow. She gives us our next medallion, and then we move on to our final destination. Uh, I was gonna make another melee joke, but I think there's been enough of those so far. I run back to the Gerudo Fortress to say hi to all my homies. I forget about the Gerudo Trading Ground because I have a memory the size of... Well, I mean, it's the size of, you know, forgetting basic words I just read off my script. And we finally head back into the desert area where I get to check out this puzzle finally. Basically what it is, is it's one of those, like, if you walk the wrong way in the sandstorm, you end up back at the beginning of the desert levels. So all you gotta do is look with your eyes, right? And you get to see the next pole in the distance, you go that way. And, you know, just using your eyes tends to be a problem for me because I have really bad eyes. After a little bit of walking, you come across this weird little desert temple thing that I thought was the spirit temple for a second, but apparently there's, like, Casper the Friendly Ghost on top of it, and he's like, hey, I'm gonna bring you to the spirit temple, bada bing! So I follow that guy through the desert, and it's actually kind of a fun segment. It reminds me of the Dompe thing, except the ghost isn't trying to kill me. I guess uh, the afterlife was kinder to this guy than it was to Dompe. And we finally arrive on the doorstep of the spirit temple, and oh boy, this one is one of my favorites in the entire game. Maybe even my absolute favorite. First thing that happens here is I walk into the front door and then I'm immediately attacked by two pots that also heal me the exact same amount of damage they did to me, so thank you and I guess how dare you. And uh, it also seems a bit like a dead end, so in my brain the anxiety cloud's starting to form and I'm like, oh man, what did I do wrong this time? Like, I don't, I don't know what to do if I don't just walk in here. But thankfully, when you walk out of the temple, Sheik appears for a mere moment. I don't like sand. Thanks, Sheik. Apparently we have to go back in time because only Child Link can access the first part of this dungeon. So we get the song from Sheik, warp back to the Temple of Time, and here we go, another dungeon as Child Link. Whereas I found the bottom of the well dungeon to be absolute hell as Kid Link, this dungeon is set up a lot more in the facet of like, we're not here to kick the shit out of you, we're here to like give you a fun, fair challenge with your limited moveset. So you're running to the temple, and there's actually a new character waiting there. She's trying to get through the small space that Adult Link couldn't fit through, so clearly she can't either, and she's like, Hey, are you a follower of Ganondorf? And me, not sure what to say about this, goes, Yeah! I love Ganondorf, man! And then she goes, Dude, come on, you don't gotta be like that. Like, I hate Ganondorf. And I'm like, Dude, me too! And apparently, me and Naburu then become best friends. So, she says, hey, we're friends, right? How about you go and go through this dangerous temple for me, you child, and find this special item that I need to do more thievery. And then Link goes, yeah, anything for you, my friend. And Link goes into the dangerous temple while Naburu stays behind to wait for him. Uh, yeah, this, this seems cool. This dungeon is my favorite one, like I mentioned before, and that is because it is very linear. Don't make fun of me, I just like it like this. Maybe... Maybe this means I would like something like Skyward Sword, or... I don't know. You know, I've heard that's pretty linear. But in here, we have our standard fighting enemies with our younger weapons, and we also have puzzles where we have to get these sun switches to bathe in the nice sunlight, almost like a nice turtle on a fine summer evening. Trekking all the way through the Spirit Temple's left side, you come across the mini-boss, which is the famous Iron Knuckle. I've heard a lot about these things. I know that if they hit you, they do like a shit ton of damage at the same time. But honestly, aside from Young Link not doing as much damage as Adult Link, like, we still have the same amount of hearts, so, like, I was, like, sort of afraid, but not the most afraid I've ever been. That was reserved for, like, spiders or something. Ugh. Fighting Iron Knuckles is actually really easy, because their telegraphed attacks are, like, really easy to dodge, and then all you gotta do is do a jump slash and then backflip back, and they just literally can't touch you. Like, I know when I was playing as Adult Link a little bit from now and fighting another Iron Knuckle, I do eat shit once, but that was because I was getting greedy, and I think that's pretty much how an enemy encounter should go. Though you think that it might get a little bit more aggressive after you break its helmet? And I think it does, but it just ends up falling back on the same patterns. I mean, I guess a lot of bosses and enemies kind of have that problem in this game. That's one thing that I think they probably fix in future entries. After defeating the Iron Knuckle, we come out onto the statue's left hand... Or right hand. I don't You know, maybe looking at it from the front... 
I'm, I can't tell my directions apart. But the point is, there's a big treasure chest out there, and wouldn't you know what, the silver no gauntlets use. that Naburu was looking for are inside. I cannot wait to bring these back to my friend, and oh, there she is down there, being sent to the Shadow Realm by witches. Man, I mean, you know, usually my friends turn into sages and vanish from my life forever, so I guess if Naburu gets sent to the Shadow Realm, we might have a chance to save her, so... You just hang in there, my friend. I'll be back to save you. In seven years. Yeah, Link's not the most reliable, but I guess that's the fault of the silver gauntlets, because only an adult can wear those things. So we come back seven years later. I'm sure she's probably fine, you know, being tortured for seven years. And we push a big block out of the way, and we've got the second half of the Spirit Temple, which is very similar to the first. Though this time we have access to things like the long shot and the bow, and then the silver gauntlets, of course where we use those to make our way through the dungeon until we find yet another iron knuckle. This one, however, is summoned onto us by those two witches from before, but you know, they didn't think to make it any stronger in the last seven years. And I'm also surprised the witches are actually still alive after that seven years, because they look pretty old to begin with. But once we do the finishing blow, the iron knuckle is toast and... Oh, hey, Nibiru, look, we saved you. We finally, we did it. And apparently she's been hypnotized for seven years to do evil for Ganondorf. That's, uh, that's unfortunate. Sorry about the wait. But don't worry, you're safe now, and everything's gonna be oh. <laughs> Dude, come on. Don't you know it's rude to disintegrate people? <sighs> Alright, fine. I guess I'll go teach the witches a lesson. So this is Kotake and Koyume, and when they battle together, they call themselves Twin Rova, which I don't really see where that name comes from. But it sounds kind of cool, and maybe it's to intimidate their enemies a little bit. One has the power of fire, one has the power of ice, and you have a mirror shield that I forgot to talk about that you get from this dungeon. What it usually does is reflect sunlight so it can help you solve those sun puzzles I talked about in the Young Link section, but in this fight it helps you reflect the magic back at the other witch sister, which does damage. Once they've taken enough damage, the two sisters actually fuse into one being, which I guess then you could call this Twin Rova, makes more sense. And fun fact, this is actually Ganondorf's mother. I, I read that on the wiki, and I think that's true. And also, she gives like a weird little saucy wink at you, and I don't know if Link's about to like make good on all those threats he made to Ganondorf over Call of Duty or not. Alright, we're just gonna beat her up. That usually works. So this part of the fight is actually really annoying to me because it's not difficult, it just doesn't make any sense. And this is where my logic once again comes in and doesn't lead me to the solution that Nintendo was expecting me to find. So basically, the mirror shield, up until this point, has only reflected things. It reflects sunlight, it reflected the beams of magic back at the other witch, but here, it actually absorbs the element that you get hit into it. So what Nintendo wants you to do is get three of the same attack right into the shield, and then it'll bounce back at Twin Rova, knock her down, and you can attack. But there's not a single time in the dungeon or otherwise where we've seen the mirror shield do this. So... I never would have arrived at that conclusion. I just kept blocking things, thinking one of them was gonna bounce back at some point, but I was just kind of wasting my time. And then, unfortunately, the rest of the boss is no different. You really just wait for three attacks, and it's just a huge waiting game, and it's a very big shame that my favorite temple ends with one of my least favorite bosses. But, uh, you kill them, and then they split back into a pair, and that's that. This also confirms the existence of heaven and hell in the Zelda universe, because Kotake and Kuyume apparently are going to heaven, and I don't really understand that, because I'm pretty sure they've been helping Ganondorf by using dark magic to just devastate the entire world, and also they disintegrated my friend right in front of me and probably killed numerous others in their whole 400-year lifespan. So, I guess that means the gods of this universe are very lenient? I mean, it's good news for the rest of us, I guess. Once we get back to the Sage Dimension, we find out, oh man, Naburu was the Spirit Sage. That's crazy, I didn't see that coming at all. Uh, also, stop creeping on me and just give me the medal, okay, dude? Alright, fine, jeez, I gotta get out of here and go help Zelda. Speaking of Zelda, Sheik is at the Temple of Time once we get back there, and he's like, sit down, man, I gotta tell you a story about a triangle or something, or I wasn't listening. And then, this is a spoiler warning for anyone who doesn't like spoilers, I'm t I mean it, this is gonna be a big bombshell, Sheik transforms into Zelda. What? I can't, I, I'm, I'm just like, I've never, I've never even played Super Smash Bros. Melee. How did, how did I not see this coming? Of course it makes so much sense. Apparently Zelda was hiding from Ganon for this entire time by pretending to be a Sheikah named Sheik. 
because, in actuality, Ganon only got one piece of the Triforce when he broke into the Sacred Realm. The other two, the Triforce of Courage and the Triforce of Wisdom, went to Link and Zelda respectively. So yeah, that's pretty neat that Zelda had the idea to, like, hide away and do all this stuff. I'm not quite sure why she didn't help with more things, but at least she gave me the teleportation songs. I mean, I have to appreciate that. Zelda then says, with the power of her and the other sages combined, they're gonna go seal Ganondorf into, like, this purgatory dimension or whatever, probably something like Phantom Ganon had to deal with, and she says, hey Link, I want you to be backup. So this part really had me excited because I was like, oh my god, Zelda's in the title of the game and she's about to go kick some Ganon ass all on her own and I just get to watch? That's incredible, like, this is some serious character development. <laughs> all right, fine, all right, yep, thanks G-Man, I, I, I guess I will go to the castle myself, and I will go save Zelda. That was, a, that was an important character development moment we were having there. But whatever, let's go to the Ganon Tower or whatever. So we head to the ruined Hyrule Castle, but I've gotta say, you know, for as many times as people have said this place has been destroyed, I am actually digging the really nice gothic architecture that Ganon's put up all over the place. And we immediately destroy the immersion by having the sages create Rainbow Road from Mario Kart so I can cross over into the temple. This is it, folks. This is the big one. This is Ganondorf's tower. And basically what we do here is on the first floor, there is a room for every sage, and then there's a barrier in the middle that we can't get through yet. So I walk over to the spirit temple door for the first one because I wasn't paying attention. I walk in there and I'm really excited to use my entire moveset I've developed over the course of this entire game to get through these challenges, and I need the fire arrows, which I don't have. So I backtrack a bit, I go find the fire arrows back in Lake Hylia, and then I'm able to go through this room, and each room on this floor is a reiteration of challenges you faced in the past, except a lot harder and you use different items to get through them. For example, there's in the Fire Temple room, you gotta use the Goron Tunic again and you have to actually use the Hover Boots and I believe the Golden Gauntlets, which you get in this dungeon, to get all the silver rupees over a bunch of boiling hot magma on a time limit. Actually, that's not true. I was trying to do it on the time limit because I was too stubborn to change into the Red Tunic at first because blue is the best color. We also have things like the water temple room where, oh my God, I walked in there and this one was on a timer for real, I swear. And I had to solve a sliding ice block puzzle on a time limit. And I, I kid you not, when I walked in there and saw that the first time, I was like, oh my God, this is where I, I fail, right? This is where I lose and I have to stop playing forever. Cause uh, I, I don't have much confidence in myself doing sliding block puzzles cause they annoy me. And also, there was a time limit involved. It was actually very easy, and I managed to get through it, and then at the end of each room, you see the respective sage again, except standing at, like, a very weird, like, Michael Jackson-esque angle, like, you know, when he's, like, leaning over. It, it's really funny to see. But I am glad to see these guys again, because over the course of the story, I've really gotten to know all these characters, aside from Rauru, and I'm just glad that they're here to help me, uh, especially Darunia. He is a total bro, and he is my favorite character in the entire Zelda universe, I think. Aside from Skull Kid, I think? I, I don't, it's tough. It's tough to know, because there are a lot of good characters. I like Ravio a lot. Once we've completed all the rooms here, the barrier in the middle is dissipated, and we're able to go up the main spire of the tower. And this is where Ganon throws a couple large enemy slash mini boss encounters. So we get to fight skeletons again, whoop de fing do. We fight the Lazelfos, we fight... Uh, I can't remember if we fight any Wolfos or not, and then we end up fighting two Iron Knuckles at the same time, but you can aggro them one at a time, and I guess uh, maybe that wasn't intended, but it makes it a lot easier because it's no different than fighting the normal Knuckles from before. But then, we enter into a chamber with plenty of stairs, and we spiral up to the sky, and at the very top, we finally find our man Ganondorf holding Zelda captive. And we finally learn one thing about Zelda. Like, we literally met this man's mother, and we just have no more insight into his backstory at all, like, not even a flashback or anything. But we do know he likes to play the organ, because he was actually playing the music you were hearing on your way up. Because he stands up, and then it stops, and I like that a lot. I guess Twin Rova had him, like, practicing organ after school every day, maybe? I don't know. Ganondorf says something evil, because he's evil, and then it's time for the fight. Ganondorf floats into the air in the middle of the chamber and starts charging up an electricity attack, throws it at you, and you need to use your sword to reflect it back at him. But here is the payoff to the joke I mentioned forever ago that I said to remember. Uh, the only other weapon that can actually defeat Ganondorf here is an empty bottle. So I guess that's why there's so little of those things in the game. 
Because you could definitely use the empty bottle to swat the electricity back at Ganondorf, and maybe he went around the entire world destroying them all because he was like, I can't have more links running around, I just can't! So back to the tennis, it's unfortunate for Ganondorf that I've been training for this my entire life. I actually used to play a lot of tennis before I stopped and gave up on it forever. And once he gets hit by his own blast, you shoot him with the light arrows that Zelda gave you earlier, he falls down, and then you go attack him. This is another one of those bosses just like Twin Rova, so I guess it's like Mother, like Son, that doesn't change at all, no matter how far the boss proceeds. And that was a little bit uh, disappointing to me, because I figured this was going to be a big climactic thing, but oh boy, we are not done yet. Once you hit Ganondorf a million times, he's down for the count, and Zelda and Link are like, alright, that was pretty good. But then the castle starts to collapse around you, because apparently Ganondorf's exerting his magic mind willpowers to try and bring the thing down on top of you, because if he can't win, then nobody will. Thus begins one of the coolest sections in, I think, any game I've ever played. We need to escape Ganondorf's tower on a time limit, and Zelda is basically doing a reverse escort mission for you, where she runs on ahead to open a door, and she'll open it once you get to her. This leads to a lot of really fun moments for me, where I'm running down the tower, and there are like magma rocks falling from the sky and like maybe there's a cutscene right where Zelda's using her special Zelda princess powers to open the door and then as soon as the cutscene's over a magma rock will just fall right on top of Link and then Zelda goes ah and it's like yeah I know I got hurt just keep running please so we keep running down the tower with this really tense music playing and it is incredible it is so much fun and then oh my god Zelda gets trapped and we're still on the timer we gotta fight more skeletons these things are the real villains of the game, I swear. So I take those things out, even though I'm extremely stressed, and I make it to the end of this section with about, like, maybe 50 seconds to spare. And I think they were pretty generous with the timer, but man, I still had a lot of fun. Link and Zelda get out of the castle, and it collapses around them, and now, Ganondorf, I'm sorry to say that your castle is just a shitty little PNG on the floor. That's what you got for being evil and stupid. Zelda, Link, and Navi are about to celebrate their victory over the evil tyrant before they hear a weird noise. So Link, being the awesome hero dude he is, gets in front of Zelda and decides he's gonna go investigate. So you walk into the rubble, and then all of a sudden, BAM! It's Ganondorf, he's back again, but he's, he's, he's pissed, dude. He doesn't even have any eyeballs anymore, because I guess he got rid of them because he was so pissed. Using the Triforce of Power, he transforms into his ultimate state, Ganon. And uh, I'm sorry I used Ganon and Ganondorf interchangeably throughout most of this video. Uh, I kind of just use them interchangeably as I usually do, but technically, when you're talking about the Beast version, that's Ganon, and the Humanoid version, that's Ganondorf. So, uh, sorry. Ganon is completely enraged, swinging his blades around, he knocks the Master Sword right out of Link's hand, past the barrier he just put up. And I'm standing there thinking, hey man, uh, maybe we could just go back to playing tennis or something, like a good old times? But apparently Ganon forgot that Link is also a skilled marksman, so Link takes out the bow with the arrows that are specifically designed to kill him, and starts attacking him in the face and then rolling around him, hitting him in the tail with these things, and it's doing massive damage, and if you run out of magic, you can still hit him with regular arrows that stun him for a lot shorter time. But I actually kind of like that, because it's like, you don't necessarily need to go find more magic in this fight, which you can. You can just end up getting through the rest of it with the regular arrows. Once he takes enough damage, he has to take a breather, because he's getting his ass kicked again, and he's probably pretty upset about it. You run out to get the Master Sword, and uh, this is where I got a little too cocky, and I got myself killed, like, instantly. <laughs> So I guess this is the Heroes Defeated timeline. Uh, I'm not sure what game comes after this, but I'm sure it'll be something good? After I died, I realized I had to redo the entire escape sequence, which didn't make me happy per se, but it was still funny when Link, you know, got pelted from above by rocks. But after a few tries of this, I was rolling around him, shooting arrows, and then slashing him with the Master Sword, and I really ended up feeling like the Hero of Time, guys. Like, it took this long but I was the hero of time in this fight. And then after enough damage has been done, Zelda is able to step in, stun Ganondorf with her special weird powers, and then Link takes this thing and just directly into Ganon's brain. But you know what's the scariest part about that? That doesn't kill him, he's still not dead. That does give them enough time, however, to seal Ganon away into the most terrifying place in existence. 
which would be, I think, the white world from Sonic Generations. And that is the end of Ganondorf, at least in this timeline. And man, dude, I can't believe this is actually the end of the game. It's been quite the journey, but we still have one thing left to do. And as Link hands over the Ocarina of Time to Zelda, and then they hold hands over it, I definitely felt some feelings as uh, Zelda tells Link that she's going to send him back to his original timeline so he can live out the childhood he never had, because he had to come to the future to defeat Ganon. And it's at this point where I'm really lamenting the fact that they didn't have, like, a choice here, you know? Because Link is, again, supposed to be the, the link between the player and the game. So, like, maybe a yes-no option, right? And maybe Link stays in this timeline, but that's unfortunately not what happens. Zelda sends him back to where he belongs, and they don't get to be together after all that. Which is really sad. You know, it's like, I, I'm not gonna lie, I, I definitely had like a tear or two welling up. But, you know, I just, I just sucked it back in there because it's not over yet. I can't, I can't let the waterworks flow. It's at this point, we see everyone rejoicing because of the defeat of Ganondorf. People are singing and dancing and Saria's song is playing with a whole bunch of different instruments and it's so nice, guys, oh my God. It's like a magical ending. It feels truly magical, and even more magical, the sages return to the real world and look out over the landscape as the sun rises on a new day. And it is so gorgeous. Holy shit, guys, it's so good. I know I'm geeking out about it, but like, I have a, part, a script, I didn't want to read it, because it's like it felt too robotic to just be like, and then the ending of the game, it's like, shut up. I, I want to be emotional. Once the credits are finished rolling, we see Link return to the Temple of Time, and Navi just kind of fucks off for no reason, and I don't think it's ever explained why. Uh, but I mean, I guess thanks for the Z-targeting, friend. It was a lot of help. And this also gets to show us how much Link has grown over this adventure, because since we no longer have control of him, he goes and does whatever he wants, and what he wants to do is stealth through Hyrule Castle again without our help, and I'm very proud of our boy for doing that. This, of course, leads him to the secret grove where he first met Zelda, the two lock eyes, and then the rest is history. I do like this ending, but there is the one part of me that knows that, you know, Zelda sent him back in time to have a nice childhood that he deserves, but that brat's headed for Termina, so technically that didn't work out. We don't know what happened to him after he goes to Termina, if he even comes back or, you know, if he's dead or something. I don't know. Game theory? I don't believe it, but... Mm. And that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about with Ocarina of Time. I, I mean, I didn't 100% the game. I'm going to save that for another playthrough, which I will definitely be doing at some point. Maybe I'll even stream it. You can let me know if you want to see that down below in the comments. And I'd also really like to know your opinions of Ocarina of Time. I'd like to know about your journeys with it, if you had something kind of like me, where I went from fraud to fan. Uh, it's very interesting to me to see how people resonate with these things, and now I kind of understand, which is even more interesting to me. The main point of this video was to see if this game could still show off all the magic that people talk about it having even 24 years later, I know if I made this next year, it could have been a 25 year special thing, but sorry, <laughs> jumping the gun. And I can say now confidently, I understand why so many people are like, hey, this is the best game ever made. Because Nintendo went and took Zelda and Mario, two of their two biggest franchises, and debatably two of the biggest gaming franchises in the world at the time. Maybe there's not even a debate there, I don't think there is. And they decided to try and cover new ground with them in the third dimension. And not only did they knock it out of the park with Mario 64, but with Zelda, they crafted something that was so close to perfect that they're still kind of leeching off that even today. Like, you can look at any of the future games and see, like, Twilight Princess does feel a lot like Ocarina. I can now say that they do feel very similar, especially in tone. Uh, though, I guess Twilight does have some Majora's Mask influence more than Ocarina but you can still kind of feel the same story. I think you even go to some of the same locations, right? Like you go to Lost Woods and you hear the song and everything. The point is, serious props to Nintendo for doing so well the first time they ever did this. Like, I can't imagine how hard it must have been on everybody to get this so good on the first try. And of course, I'm not gonna stand here and tell you, hey, I think this is the best game of all time now, because I still have other things that I think are better. It's my personal opinion, but I definitely see the merits of this game 
but I definitely also see the drawbacks, because this game has aged a little bit. Like, I don't like some of the dungeon designs, some things feel a little obtuse here and there, but, but there's no way the bad that I experienced in this game outweighs the good stuff. Because the sense of adventure, the music, the characters, some of my favorite dungeons and cutscenes, it, it's too good for me to not play this game again because of, you know, the bottom of the well let's say. You know, because now I can actually do it a little better, I assume. But I think that's going to be all for me for now. I actually recorded about 50 minutes of this video in a second take because I lost all of the footage from the end of the review, so that's why I'm wearing a different shirt. Uh, you know, gotta respect Dr. Pepper and his medical practices and all that. So I'm very exhausted, still pretty bitter that I lost that footage, but I'm very happy that this video will finally be able to be made because this was a big important one for me. It's my comeback from the brink of surgical pain, if you want to put it like that, and it's also just something special because I found something special in this game. So I appreciate you coming on this journey with me, and as part of that thanks, I wanted to tell you about this new channel that I'm putting up. If you are a YouTube content creator or, you know, any form of content creator where you can use video footage, I am starting a channel where I'm going to start uploading all of the footage I use for these videos, not the camera footage, the game footage onto another channel that you can use for whatever you want as long as you link back to it so other people can use it if they want. As a content creator, I know that sometimes it's really annoying to get your own footage for things, and sometimes there are problems like where your 3DS capture card stops working midway through your entire playthrough. So, that stuff will be up there for grabs if you or anyone else wants it. Uh, I just want to help people out when I can, and uh, yeah. If you end up using it for anything, let me know in the comments. I'd love to see what you make with it. Of course, the footage is not going to be perfect. There's going to be a lot of times where maybe there's some sound inconsistencies. Maybe I stand in place for a while, and that's because I'm writing down notes for the video. But, uh, you know, it's up there and you can use it. So, be my guest. But yeah, that's it. I'm very glad to report that even 24 years later, Ocarina of Time is still a kick-ass game, and the magic will clearly never die. Oh boy, guys. Uh, in the previous segment that was recorded, I mentioned how tired I was for recording for three hours straight, uh, but I lost about 45 minutes of that, so that's what I just recorded now. Uh, <laughs> I'm still tired. But if you made it this far, please let me know down in the comments, because not a lot of people will make it here, especially with the long video, and now you're in the secret club, which is for cool people who make it this far in the video. I'd also like to give a huge thank you to my current supporters, who are Chaotic Mercenary, Brady Hilkemeyer, Mimic, Noah Wisbios, Danny Lee Dauber, Mike TGC, Ty Little Tech Guide, Jeremy, Dax, T-Bone APH, Crystal, PM13, Chaos, Dork in a Hat, Mega Traffic Cone, and on Patreon, Noah Wisbios again, and John the Real Wawa Luigi. Thank you also to all the people in the $1 tier, that helps a lot as well, and if you have any interest in becoming a supporter yourself, you can click the join button below the video or check out the card up there for my Patreon and you get access to a whole bunch of members only videos which you can find, maybe I'll put those up there so you can actually just find them. But uh, there's bloopers, there's gameplay footage where I talk and you know commentate over things and you also get special roles in the Discord if you are there. But that's going to be all for me. Thank you so much for watching and I will catch you guys later.